Dr. Luc Montagnier first noticed the remarkable interaction of bacteria and water ten years ago, while studying a small bacterium known to be a frequent companion of HIV, the Mycoplasma pyrum. Like HIV, this bacterium loves human white blood cells, also known as lymphocytes. Starting with a culture of human lymphocytes infected with the bacteria, Montagnier then passed the culture through filters with pores small enough to prevent the passage of the bacteria and lymphocytes. What passed through the filter was the fluid in which the bacteria had been cultured, minus the bacteria and lymphocytes that had been filtered out. Further tests on this fluid filtrate showed that it was indeed negative for signs of the Mycoplasma pyrum bacteria. Then, a curious thing happened. When the filtrate, containing no bacteria, was incubated with a new batch of bacteria-free human lymphocytes, the original Mycoplasma bacteria was found to fully regenerate within the new lymphocytes. Where had this bacteria come from? The evidence pointed to an exciting possibility: that somehow the original Mycoplasma bacteria had transmitted into the structure of the fluid medium itself. The information needed to regenerate itself at a later stage, but that wasn't all. Next came the big surprise. After multiple dilutions with highly purified water, the apparently sterile filtrates were found to produce low-frequency electromagnetic waves, which were detected after the filtrates were placed inside a copper coil attached to an amplifier. Waves in the frequency range of 500 to 3,000 hertz. Within what is considered the low end of the radio frequency spectrum, were observed in the dilutions of many different kinds of filtrates, in solutions that had been infected with bacteria and viruses, in the plasma of the blood of humans infected by these same agents, and in the diluted filtrates of DNA extracted directly from these bacteria and viruses. One other important condition was required for the emission of such waves. The presence of an electromagnetic background radiation of about seven hertz, which corresponds to the approximate frequency of the natural resonating cavity formed between the surface of the Earth and its electrically charged ionosphere, known as the Schumann resonance. This frequency could also be produced artificially in the laboratory. In further experimentation. Montagnier showed that different dilutions of the same filtrates could communicate with each other in a form of crosstalk. To test this, a sample of non-emitting dilution was placed alongside a sample of emitting dilution of the same species. The non-emitting sample appeared to silence the emitting sample, indicating that some type of electromagnetic signal does indeed emanate from the seemingly non-emitting sample, but which. Perhaps because it is too weak, is not recorded directly by the copper coil. In another strange twist, when the now silenced sample was further diluted, an electromagnetic signal reappeared. We have already seen that species-specific electromagnetic signals emanating from the water of the diluted filtrate seem to be connected to a species-specific imprint in the structure of the water itself. The next phase of experimentation showed this in an even more dramatic way. A fragment of DNA from the HIV virus was used as the source. A solution containing a number of copies of the DNA fragment was filtered and then diluted until an electromagnetic signal was obtained, as in the previous experiments. Then a further filtration and dilution was carried out on both this sample as well as on a sample of pure water. Both samples were then placed inside a copper coil, which was inside a box of mu metal, which has the property of blocking out external low-frequency electromagnetic fields. A low-intensity 7 hertz electric current was fed through the copper coil to generate the stimulating background radiation. After 18 hours, the tube containing pure water was removed and found to emit its own electromagnetic signal. But. The most remarkable step came next. The organic ingredients normally used for making copies of DNA were then added to the tube containing pure water. Normally, for these raw materials to be able to assemble multiple copies of DNA, 
at least one strand of the DNA to be copied needs to be present to serve as a template. In this case, none was added, and the pure water sample, with the added ingredients of nucleotides, primers, and polymerase, was subjected to the normal cycle of heat exposure used in the process of DNA replication. The results were astounding. Not only was a DNA fragment produced within this sample, but it was 98% identical in sequence to the original DNA fragment of HIV. How is this regeneration from water possible? Just as with the pure water sample, in all these experiments with bacteria, viruses, and their DNA, the emitting filtrates are so highly diluted as to have almost no likelihood of containing the original genetic material. To account for the measured effects, Montagnier has adopted a hypothesis developed by a number of researchers into the anomalous properties of water, namely, that in a liquid state, water is not a random agglomeration of molecules, but rather that chains of water molecules can constantly form coherent nanostructures, which may be both the products of, and the sources for, electromagnetic resonance phenomena. While Montagnier's experiments are not yet conclusive, they are nevertheless consistent with a rigorous experimental approach that goes back to such figures as Alexander Gervich, who had shown in the 1920s that the emission of electromagnetic radiation in the ultraviolet range was involved in the process of cell mitosis. More recent work by Fritz Popp and colleagues has confirmed that the source of this UV spectrum light, which he named biophotons, is the DNA in the cell nucleus, and that biophoton emissions correlate with known biological rhythms of diurnal, lunar, and other periodicity. There are many important questions posed by Montagnier's work so far. Further experimentation and further refinement of the instruments involved must obviously be carried out to begin to answer these questions. A broad view of the results of Montagnier, however, touch upon a most fundamental question as to the nature of life. The principle first elaborated by Francesco Redi in the 17th century and later emphasized by Vladimir Vernadsky that all life comes from life, has never been shown to be violated in any experiment to date. But in discussing the principle, it is usual to envision some material process, such as egg and sperm, spore, or cell division, as the responsible agent. In the results reported here, however, the life principle appears to be transmitted, at least in part, not by the immediate presence of a material substance, but immediately in connection with a signal detectable as electromagnetic in origin, and seemingly connected to broader electromagnetic characteristics of the environment. The further elaboration of the mechanisms, whether by formation of nanostructures in water as suggested, or perhaps by additional means, remains to be worked out. What is clear is that the results require an extension of that usually limited conception of life, the principle of all life from life still holds, but only on the condition that we adopt a non-particle conception of life. <laughs>